In this segment, I'm going to talk about security from an economic perspective. Over the past 15 years, we've realized that many of the most interesting and important information security problems are about incentives one way or another. One of the first problems that we looked at was distributed denial of service. Now, that came along in 1998, and it really changed the dynamics of the antivirus industry. Because before then, if your PC got infected, then the virus might very well damage your PC, for example, by deleting stuff on your hard disk. And this was done typically just for malicious fun by the kids who wrote viruses. And this would cause you to go out and spend a few bucks on buying antivirus software for protection. However, since 1998, if you get malware, the malware will typically just use your PC for sending spam or doing DDoS attacks. So why should you care so much about defending it? Suddenly the harm is falling on somebody else. It's not your problem anymore. Another factor that affected the antivirus industry from the beginning is asymmetric information. Now this is one of the interesting market failures that's particularly relevant to our trade. And in fact, uh, back in 2000, George Akerlof won the Nobel Prize for a beautiful paper he wrote back in the 1970s about the market for lemons. And suppose he said that there's a town with 100 used cars for sale, 50 good cars that are worth $2,000, and 50 lemons, 50 cars that always break down that are worth, say, $1,000 each. Now, you might think naively that the fair market price for cars in that town would be $1,500, which is the expected value of uh, a used car that's sold. But the key thing here is that sellers know which car is a good car and buyers don't. So if the price were $1,500, then nobody with a good car would ever offer it for sale. And so the price ends up pretty rapidly being $1,000. And that's why whenever you buy a new car, about a quarter drops off the price the instant you drive it out of the showroom. Now one fix for this is for sellers to offer a warranty because this is cheaper for people who have good cars so it can act as a kind of signal and that can be a way of fixing markets that are broken by asymmetric information. But in the case of antivirus um, there was a problem because if you were running an antivirus company you had a simple choice. Would you build a professional product which would be expensive and require care and maintenance? Or would you pile it high, sell it cheap and spend all your money on marketing? And from the beginning of the industry, um, asymmetric information favoured the latter strategy. Because if you had a company, your auditors would come round every year and they'd ask, do you have antivirus? Not, which antivirus product do you have? So of course you'd buy the cheapest. And even now, the problem persists because we find that the top 10 mobile antivirus products don't do remote wipe properly of your mobile phone. Why? Because the budget's mostly spent on marketing. There's a third problem with antivirus, which is that until about 2005, most antivirus products would detect most known threats. But since then, the bad guys got organized and now the underground economy is specialised and there's some people send spam and some people write viruses and some people cash out stolen credit cards and so on. And this means that the guys who, who write malware are basically doing it for a living. They're professionals, they're firms. Okay, so they have got R&D departments and they have test departments and they see to it they don't ship a product until it's been tested, which means that the existing antivirus firms don't find it. And that means that it becomes an arms race, a dynamic game, whereby a new piece of malware is produced and then the AV firms update their products to detect it and then the bad guys update their virus so that the antivirus products don't detect it and so on. And this is a very, very different kind of operation. And that brings us to the patching cycle, which affects good firms as well as bad firms. What happens here is that people discover bugs which can be exploited and they're reported to the vendors. And the vendors then issue patches so that these bugs are removed, they're at least no longer exploitable. And customers then apply these patches either at once or perhaps later. And vulnerability is where an attacker's got a bug that the target hasn't yet patched. And the optimal policy here uh, we figured out is responsible disclosure, uh, whereby if you discover a bug, you report it to the software vendor, to Microsoft or whoever, and give them some months to patch it before you actually um, publish details of the vulnerability. 
If you never disclose the bug, of course, then the vendor has got no incentive to go and patch the software. So this is an interesting thing that security economists study. So you've ended up with some software, perhaps PC software or on a phone or perhaps software that's running on a, a payment terminal. And how can you signal that it's good? How can you escape from the trap that the antivirus firms fell in? Well, signals are a way to deal with asymmetric information and they're widely used by firms like eBay or the Grameen Bank or Google in order to signify that you're a good merchant, that you're a trustworthy person to whom to lend money. But certification is really, really hard to do right and a whole lot of things go wrong with it. Some certification authorities become too big to fail and we just have to trust them even when they've been hacked because if you don't then you find that you can't buy plane tickets anymore. So we get locked in in unpleasant ways by market forces in effect, um, herding effects uh, to particular CAs. And many other schemes turned out to be intrinsically weak because nobody had an incentive to defend them. Here's an example, payment systems. Um, back in 2008, 2009, there were a whole series of attacks on pin entry devices in Europe where bad guys put wicked electronics into pin entry devices which would capture customer card data and this would then be used to make forge cards that rip people off. And this happened despite the fact that the pin entry devices were certified secure. It turned out that uh, Visa, MasterCard, etc. had certified these devices as secure despite the fact that they could be hacked with a, a few pounds worth of components and a bit of effort. And it turned out that acquiring banks which do business with merchants and issuing banks which issue cards to customers have got different incentives because the acquiring bank pays for the terminals and it's the issuing bank who pays for the fraud. And even if a bank does both acquiring and issuing, they're typically done by different departments which hate each other. And so, looked at in the round, neither banks nor government cared enough about the certification problem to do it properly. And as a result, we got a whole wave of fraud, which cost tens of millions of pounds. So if you want evidence-based policy and all this stuff can go wrong, then you'd better go out and collect evidence. Theoretical models are all very well, but we have to know what's actually happening in practice if we're going to give sound advice to policymakers. And there's a number of um, people who are um, engaged in doing this kind of practical research. Uh, we've produced a couple of reports, Security Economics and the Internal Market for the EU, um, looked at what could be done at the European level, and among other things we advocated breach disclosure laws, uh, like we have in America. And a more recent report for the UK government measuring the cost of cybercrime looked at the extent to which cybercrimes um, impose externalities on people. And we found that pure cyber crimes, things like fake AV and, uh, and so on, um, often have the, the property that the indirect costs um, can cost a hundred times what the direct costs are, what the money made by the actual spammers or scammers is. And one conclusion that we draw from this is that enforcement is way below socially optimal levels. And one reason for this is that um, cybercrime tends to be industrial scale petty crime and the individual offences, the theft of a few hundred pounds or a few hundred dollars or a few hundred euros, are below the radar of your local police force. And the fact that the bad guy is managing to steal a few hundred pounds from several hundred people every day, of course, makes it big time crime, but the police don't join the dots and so they don't go after the bad guys the way they should. So one lesson is that we should spend more money on chasing and locking up the bad guys. What does motivate the cops? Well, we know that the cops can catch the bad guys if they're suitably motivated, and this is a, a, a young man who was sent to prison in the UK along with some others when they were foolish enough to hack police websites. So, I mean, anybody in a bad part of town could have told you it's not a good idea to steal police cars. So the question is not whether the police can catch the bad guys, um, it's whether they want to. And in fairness to the police, the police tell us that, well, it's all down to the incentives that they're set, to the targets um, that they're set by their political masters and the criteria by which they're graded and given more money or given promotion or whatever. So fundamentally, this is a political problem of coordinating police action. 
In summary, security economics has grown into a research field of over 100 people. It's highly cross-disciplinary. Economic models are essential to secure systems with multiple competing principles. And that's pretty well all systems nowadays. You have to set the rules so that when people act in a selfish way, the outcome, the equilibrium from their self-interest and striving is something that you can live with. Because if it isn't, then that system isn't going to be sustainable. And we find that pretty well every interesting security problem these days has got an economic angle.